Welcome to Attitude of Altitude podcast presented by Planet of One. This podcast is designed to inspire change in people to become the best versions of themselves and live their best lives. We share stories of struggle and success to encourage and empower listeners to be bold, take action, and be the change we desire to see in this world. We are all part of this planet. We are all a planet of one. Know that your attitude determines your altitude in life. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to Attitude of Altitude. Our special guest today is the artist Patrick Carney, who has been a artist to lots of stars throughout the years. And not just an artist, he's been running a group for 40 years of Mastermind. So please help us welcome Patrick Carney, one of my favorite people. Welcome, Patrick. How are you? <laughs> Thank you, Rima. I'm so thrilled to be here with you. As I, I wanted our guests to get to know you as I have gotten to know you through the Mastermind group, but I wanted them to learn about the artists, some of the things that you've learned, some of the people that you've worked with, names that people wouldn't think an artist would be able to get to on a simple level, but you've been able to do that through your art. So I'm going to give you carte blanche to start talking and letting our members know who you are. <laughs> well, yes, I, I'm an artist. I, I um, paint rock and roll stars, portraits of rock and roll stars for a living. And I started that the day after the Beatles appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show in February of 1964. And uh, when I showed up in the art room that Monday, the day after, and I produced my first drawing of John Lennon, went went crazy. And I thought, oh, okay, this is fun. Let's just see... Uh, how this goes and and I've been doing it for all those years since now I want you to let the audience know that you actually met John Lennon you actually painted a portrait of him and Joko how did you even reach that kind of level well um, I started uh, doing art as you know really seriously professionally as a junior in high school and um as a senior my pen, uh, my first or my senior painting for the year was a painting of bob dylan and bob dylan came and bought it so i was like wow this is pretty cool you know and i um decided that basically then and there that i was going to continue to do it and see if see if i could make a living at it you know, because all I ever heard f from, you know, friends and other parents and aunts and uncles was, you know, artists starve. And uh, I was going to go out and prove them wrong. And so I have. So you had the attitude from the beginning that you could definitely make a go of this. Yeah. And... Um, I, I was blessed to have a phenomenal art teacher in in high school who told me, he said, Patty, don't let people rent space in your mind. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah. Because, you know, any individual that discourages someone from their dream and you allow them into your brain, they're renting space. So I, I kept kicking them out of my brain. And so when um, I, I uh, went to art school in New York City, I started to meet really, really talented individuals, both in the art world and in the music world, which is where I was heading. And at SVA, the School of Visual Arts in New York City, where I studied, um, what my painting teacher um, has become um, – one of the um, the greats in the world. I mean, his paintings today sell 
in 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 the tune of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, you know. And um, he was a photorealist, and he painted huge. I mean, huge. And so when I went out to paint, I started to paint huge museum size pieces. So by the time John Lennon was on his so-called long weekend, which was a year and a half, when uh, Yoko sent him away with uh, her secretary, May Pang, and May and, and John became lovers during that period of time, uh, he ended up in Los Angeles. And I was in the Los Angeles doing work um, for, um, uh, I guess it was Dick Clark's um, American Bandstand. Yeah, that's what it would have been. It would have been Dick Clark's American Bandstand. And Dick Clark introduced me to John Lennon. And how did that continue that relationship for you to actually paint him? Because a lot of people meet stars, but it doesn't mean it goes anywhere. So what, what Well, you know, we didn't, have, we, we, <laughs> we didn't have cell phones or any of those kind of things to whip out at that point and show anyone your art. And, and however, I did carry at that time a, um, a drawing pad. And I had some sketches in there that John really took to. And um, he, he ordered three paintings. And by the time I was done with the three paintings, I got back to the East Coast. Um, John and Yoko were back together. So um, I had to deliver them to the Dakota. And you just can't walk up to the front door, knock on the, uh, you know, and, and get into the Dakota. However, having my persuasive ways, I got past the gatekeeper after I told him that John had already given me a $3,000 deposit to, um, to deliver the paintings. Please share that story. I've heard it before, but it'd be so interesting for our listeners to actually hear this wonderful story of yours. So uh, I was ushered upstairs um, to the inner sanctum and John was standing behind uh, Yoko looking a little sheepish. And I could tell what was his on his mind because the same thing was on my mind. You know, now that they had gotten back together at the Elton John concert at Madison Square Garden, um, that I was to open the, sa the right painting first. And all the, the, the three paintings were exactly the same size wrapped in manila paper. So I couldn't tell which one was which. I didn't mark them up. And uh, so I'm manifesting, John's manifesting, and I opened the right painting. And it was a painting of John and Yoko. And Yoko turned to him and said, oh, you, you did love me. You still love me. And um, so everything ended well. And we opened the other two paintings, which were, uh, one of John rather young and one of John in really, really long hair and a beard. Um, and uh, it, it, it went well. How do you think throughout your life you manifested all these incredible people that you've had the pleasure of not only painting, but getting to actually meet them? Well, I think it's the laws of the universe. You know, and, and one, one that we study all the time is the law of attraction. And I believe that we can manifest into our lives uh, the individuals that are supposed to be in our lives. I we can agree. manifest the, the wrong people, you know. And, and the greatest law, I believe, is uh, love. And love conquers everything. So I attempt to... manifest love into East Peace, I do, to capture the essence, to capture the aura, to capture the, the soul of the individual I am drawing. So if you look at um, the, draw the paintings that I do, um, it's all about the eyes. It's all about tapping into their very soul and allowing love to ease through every stroke. To, to, because what I do is I attempt to know the subject intimately. And as I study who I'm going to paint or who I'm going to draw, I bring them into my own soul and I bring them into my own heart. 
And that allows me to let the essence, the, the aura of the flow down through from the heart, down my right arm, because I'm right-handed, into my fingers, into the brush or the pen, and allow the love to, to just ease in the, either the canvas or on the watercolor paper that I use. What are some of the most wonderful paintings that resonate with you that you've done? One of, that I'm really proud of is probably uh, a collection called The Women of Essence, where I um, created a 19th piece collection, each painting being three different women in, in the one painting of one face. So I would take the eyes from one, I would take the nose from the other, the, the mouth or lips from another, and create a unique individual at, uh, from the standpoint of them influencing me the most. So these three people influenced me around, let's say, inspiration, or they influenced me around light, or whatever it might be, and I put them together as one piece. So it's very interesting for a couple of them to come to the uh, the opening and uh, attempt to figure out which painting uh, they were in. That is so neat. What was their feedback? Did any of them recognize themselves as any of the paintings? <laughs> the funny, absolutely all did. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they were, were flattered. They, they, uh, cause most of these people were from high school or college days. They weren't from current days. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, it went back way back. Um, so you know it's kind of fun to do it. I'm I'm in a new I'm in the middle of a new one, which is taking quite a few years to do. Um, there's 48 pieces in the new one, and um, it's called the Women of Excellence. So the, those are people from today. You know, the last X amount of years, actually, last 20 years from people since I've been in California. That's so neat. Any names that people would go, oh, I wish to see that painting. Someone that stands out. I know there's well, there's that. somebody named uh, Rima in the collection. <laughs> uh, Sharon Lecter, um, Salon Sheppy, uh, uh, Yuri Shoy, uh, Silver Becca Hill, um, Aliyah Ott. So there's you know people that have influenced me since I've been here that I am um, including in the Woman of Excellence. Let us understand the mastermind process, the group that you've been running for 40 years. And that's where I got to know Patrick and has been a mentor of mine in moving us along. Explain to us what a mastermind is. For most people that hear the word mastermind don't really understand it to begin with. Uh, ma mastermind uh, for, for an overall purpose is, is mind blending. And um, what I believe is that 80% of what we actually need in life is in our sphere of influence. So in my case, we're following the directions of Napoleon Hill in his great book, Think and Grow Rich, and, um, and his Law of Success class, teaching the... the um, mastermind process which is based on what's called the hot seat and what happens is it let's say it's you you're sitting on the hot seat and your desire is to write a book you give us an outline of your desire then you symbolically duct tape your lips and you can't speak anymore and the, the other 11 members of the mastermind give you brilliant heart-centered feedback. However, where synergy and the mind blending come in is that there's not just 11 people in the room. There's a new math. New math is one and one is three. One and one is 30. One and one is 300. One and one is 3,000. Because in that hot seat mind blending synergistic space 
is every sibling, every parent, every uncle, every aunt, every teacher, every professor, every book you've read, every uh, seminar you've been to, all of it mind-blending, combining the outcome. So on the days that it really, really goes well, we're sitting about six feet off the ground. And the mind blending just just happens. Now you've been running this. And the for coolest 40. thing in forty years, yeah. Uh, you know, when it works really well, everyone is all in. You know, and you've been there, you've experienced it, you've been in the hot seat. Um, and the coolest thing is no one has to apologize for not knowing something prior to getting the information during the hot seat. What has kept you going for 40 years, every week, running this mastermind? Because that is a rarity. The, the, the real gift for each and every member and for me is that I get an aha or I get a nugget each and every week. I mean, you and I 45 minutes ago just ended today's session. Yeah. And I believe... There was a minimum of a hundred ahas, yeah. and probably a lot more. <laughs> probably a lot more. You know, it's 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 contagious. You know, and 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 it's not been the same members except for me for forty years. So so I've had so many opportunities to meet so many brilliant uh, brilliant individuals and share in the opportunity to to receive the gift of their brilliance and 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 that's what the key is it's the key, the key is not to stay in the status quo we must continue to grow it is i, I believe we're put here to grow and to you know jump on every opportunity to learn something unique each and every day how did you become the individual that you are based on your upbringing how did you become this person well i i start i, I started to get lessons really early um you know, from some, some early pain. Um, I'm the oldest of six children. And um, my mother had all six of us at seven years. And when my youngest brother was um, just under a year old, uh, my father died. So my mother had to um, raise us as a single parent and be both father and, and mother to us. And how the first lesson was when my Sam Sneed, my father was a PGA professional, and Sam Sneed came to the funeral and he asked my mother, uh, "Hey, Jenny, what do you need?" And she said, "I would love it that I wouldn't have to work until my youngest brother Timmy was in school in first grade." So Mike Fetchick and Doug Ford and Sam Snead and the Tedessa brothers and Red O'Keefe and a bunch of those PGA professionals at the time, this is 1956, uh, ran a series of pro-ams for my mother for five years until my brother was in school. So I learned that life is a team sport right out of the gate. That was a real, real lesson to learn um, early on that all we have to do is ask and I've learned over the years that the bigger the person is the more successful the person is the most famous the person is they're the most available 
because no one ever asks them for anything. Is this where you, no. you've gotten your attitude of really inspiring and helping people get to their goal? Is that where that came from? I would think so. Um, I, I've been blessed. You know, growing up in New York, being a New Yorker, we didn't have a lot of transformation. We weren't introduced to transformation. Although I was introduced to some really great life lessons and and what have you. Um, and, uh, and the reason that, that uh, I live the way I live and, and, and the strategies – um, that I use um, come from transformational leaders. And so the first one I ever met, um, I was doing an art show in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And this guy came up on a Sunday afternoon. And my people didn't come to the shows on Sunday. They were there Wednesday through Saturday. So I was just um, painting and getting ready for to close up at 5 o'clock. And uh, one of the lessons I learned early was um, to uh, have a chair next to me, always. When we were in art school, we had a chair next to us. When, you know, when I'm in my studio, I have a chair next to me. And the idea is anyone can sit down with you and talk to you or absorb or learn or what have you. So we could go around the room in, at SVA and, and, um, and learn. And so I had that extra chair at my art show, and this guy sat down, told me his name was Charlie. And we talked for an hour, and he just could not believe that I was making a living selling rock and roll art portraits. He just, it, it was Florida. However, we had such a good time, he invited me to dinner. And I went out to his house after I, I took an hour to break down, and then I drove out to his house and met his family and and whatnot and i really still only knew him as charlie i never heard a last name i didn't hear anything and until we went out into a converted barn that he had and i swear there was twenty thousand volumes of books in this converted barn and he gave me my first copy of think and grow rich and the guy's name turned out to be charlie tremendous jones and uh, he was one of the early speakers, trainers, and, and what an influence he had on me because he challenged me to read each chapter three times and then call him. And uh, he mentored me through that book. And when we got to the chapter um, seven, chapter seven is Mastermind, he convinced me to start the mastermind and that's how I started the mastermind. That's so interesting. I did not know that, that that's how you got started on the mastermind. And if listeners don't know who Charlie Tremendous Jones is, look him yeah. up. One Maybe. of the things he said to me early <laughs> on. Can you hear me, Patty? Yeah, I, I think you broke up. Okay. Um, he told me, one of the greatest lines, uh, if I can remember it exactly, it was, um, if you talk to your friends like you talk to yourself, would you have any friends? <laughs> and that was quite the conversation. Um, and uh, I, I have used it as a self-love tool ever since to understand that we can't give love uh, unless we love ourselves. That is such a brilliant thing to have learned and shared. I see that in the mastermind. And I'm going to say for people that don't know you and haven't met you, the first impression for some people is they're intimidated by your presence and who you are. Yet when they get to know you, you're all about moving people to their next level. And you have a very special way of, especially for women, to move them forward with lots of love and respect. I'd love for you to share on that one. 
Well, I think that comes from my mother. My mother was a very unique individual. She was a a school teacher. She taught typing and, and business. And she had a real way of teaching us children how to honor women, how to, um, you know, understand what a woman was and understand that we had to honor their brilliance. And she felt that there should be, and, and we're talking the 60s now, a lot more women at the head of corporations than there were. And, you know, looking at what's going on in the world today, uh, you know, with, with the virus and et cetera, what's going on, the countries that did the best against the virus were all women. The countries that did the worst were men. Um, so my mother used to say, you know, Patty, it's all about designing a life worth smiling about. And I am in touch, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very in touch with my feminine side. So all of my f best friends are women. It's just the way it is. Um, and uh, I learned early on to honor, honor women. And, and so, you know, it's funny when the mastermind started, though, it was uh, 11 men and one woman. And today, it's it has gone. It's gone the reverse. It went to eleven women and one man, and now it's three men and um, nine women. So, it, you know, it it and it's changed over the years. Why do you think the shift happened? In from men versus women being more women based now. What draws uh, them to Sil the mastermind? Sylvia Becker Hill. Hmm. She, she told me when she came in, and she was one of those that was intimidated by me, um, and she said it on stage, so it's no big deal for me to say it. At this point, I'm not letting a secret out of the bag. Uh, she said to me, you know what I'm going to do? Because this, that was one of the times it was 11 to 1 when she came in. She said, I'm going to change the dynamics. And I said, go ahead. You know, and so um, as people moved, and in her case, we had a, um, nine of the members move out of the country. So as, as the members moved out of the country, um, she filled them with women. She brought women in, you know, handpicked uh, those individuals that were in at the time, you know, like Aaliyah, um, you know, and, and um, it was fine, you know. It was, you know, it was perfect for what we were, we were doing because, you know, Successful people seek counsel and unsuccessful people listen to opinion. And what we create in the mastermind and especially with uh, the current, current group that we have right now is we're all about counsel. What's the most memorable person that has gone through the mastermind for you and what makes them memorable? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I believe the word has always been freedom. The freedom to do what they choose to do and not allow society or um, the world in any way to, to dictate what they're doing. Like I had um, one of the great members was a guy named Chad Nash, and he had uh, a vision to travel the world. And uh, we did a hot seat around it. And he is now, I believe, at his 159th country, making more money now traveling than he did when he was in the mastermind. And he even hosted the mastermind in his house for about a year and a half. Um, we also did a hot seat for him uh, around uh, his, his best-selling book, which it was called the, um, the Lion in the Cubicle. Mm -hmm. And it was a great book. And 
you know, one of the great things about leaders and leaders that are attracted to the mastermind, the they these these leaders tell you what you need to know, not what you'd love to hear. You know, and and that's part of the success of what we do. You know, because I believe, I really, really, really believe this, and, and it's probably a an influence from from my art high school art teacher. Uh, it is that uh, when you're conceived, you already have all your talents in you. Mm. And it just needs to be brought out, and you know. Picasso said in a, in, in a quote that um, every child is an artist. The trick is to stay an artist as you grow up. And so I'm blessed that I had the support uh, from my mother um, that I could grow into my desire to be an artist. I love everything you're saying. Since you have been through... 40 years, lots of members that have graduated and gone on to great things. What are some of the things where you notice people that are not moving forward? What holds them back? Could you elaborate on what you've seen? Well, um, Dennis Whitley said one time, uh, I remember I was in, a, in, in an event that he was speaking at and he said, you know, you can sleep when you're dead. Good one. <laughs> and meaning, you know, take massive action. Don't, you know, don't rest, you know. And I'm not saying not to stay healthy in any of those kind of things. However, typically in the mastermind, it's people aren't taking massive action in a timely manner. You know, and, and self-talk. Um self-doubt even when they have this team around them um, it doesn't always allow them to get away from what their parents talk, taught them or um, that fear that um, that comes you know Rhonda Britton who survived her father shooting her mother in front of her and then shooting himself after the gun misfired shooting at her says at the start of her speeches when she speeches speaks live and she gets on stage and she waits for the applause to die down after she's been introduced she says how you clap tells me how you live So she already knows as she looks out at the audience and she's taking in adulation, she's observing and knowing if this one or that one or this one's going to take action. She could tell from stage. You know, she say, wake up, Patty. Get fully invested in your new life. Be happy to be you today. And I used to, I bought right into that, man. I'm happy. I'm I'm all excited about being who I you know. You know, like I might have done six hundred paintings and I started over. Because mm. I decided to paint differently. You know, I figured out last year that I have seventy two thousand hours in. First studying, then creating. And I heard once, I forget who said it, so I can't give credit, but it was it's not me, that once you put 10,000 hours in, you're a master. So I accepted, once I heard that, I said, oh, okay. If I got 72,000 hours in, I'm a, I'm a master. And so now that I say that, I should think about how many hours I have in in the mastermind over 40 years, and I'll, I'll come up with a number and, and you know. 
because fear in our minds is here to keep us safe not allow us to take the steps we need to get beyond that fear fear absolutely loves us it's just attempting to keep us safe well who the hell wants to be safe let's get out there and create that new masterpiece let's get out there and and, and create a new millionaire in the mastermind or allow an individual who has a dream of affecting and impacting one billion people to do it. That's what we're all about. I mean, why stop at one person? I love how you truly give the individual that opportunity to shine and go beyond what they see themselves. You see in them more than they see in themselves and you edge them along to their greatness. But you also have individuals that sometimes will not be able to take on those next steps. How are adults different than kids? Because I know you mentor kids too. So, Well, the kids have no fear. None. And kids <laughs> don't, you know, pussyfoot around. They tell you exactly what they think, when they think it. They're so open and so thankful to be gifted whatever it is that you're gifting them, whether it is to teach them to ride a bike or to teach them balance or to teach them, you know, how to, how to, uh, to paint a picture or how to feel and, and capture the essence before you even ever pick up a pen. And the first time you get them to do it, they do it with their eyes closed. They draw with their eyes closed. That's, that's what kids, when you, uh, you know, attempt to gift a, an adult that and ask them to stretch, to risk, to, you know, tap into their deepest fear. They don't always do it. Like, my, my biggest fear in life was fear of heights. It's what I grew up with. So what the hell did I do? Went skydiving. I'm going to jump out an airplane. I'm going to prove to me that I can do this. You know? And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's not allowing the fear to run your life. Not only did you go skydiving, I know that you went skydiving multiple times. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's the key. But the funniest one, the hardest one, the, the, where fear itself took over was the second one. Because the first jump, it's a blur. It really is. And we were jumping... It's 1974. We're jumping on a static line. My brothers, my two brothers and I, my poor mother down on the ground with the rosary beads, praying for her three sons who were jumping out of the airplane for the first time. You know, it's a blur. And, and, and you just jump. And the second time, when we're jumping out of a Cessna 182, there's no door. There's a pilot and a jump master. And so the second time, I was first in line to go out. And what happens is you step on this little maybe a 14 or 16 inch long step that's about six inches wide and you hang on to the strut of the of the airplane jump master hits in you in the head and you go well i jumped however my hands didn't let go there i am floating like this like those old black and white movies <clears throat> that the uh, hollywood used to make and I'm thinking, what the heck am I doing? I look at the jump master, and his face is all torn by the wind. And then I let go. And I was no longer over the jump zone. So I had to walk back a mile with a damn chute over my shoulder. Um, taught me a, a great lesson, you know. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, Scott Duffy says to me all the time, you know, Patty, find the, find the simplest way. 
Don't complicate. We humans complicate everything. And so for the mastermind to be successful, for people in the mastermind to be successful, they they can't be complicated. It can't be complicated. It has to be simple. And they 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 have to know without a doubt their why. You know, focus on one hammer and one nail. That's a great one. One hammer and one nail. To get moving. Yeah, because if you pick up two hammers, who the hell's going to hold the nail? <laughs> <laughs> Did you do another skydive after that? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You got to get up. You got to get, you got to get up and go do it. Everything, everything, Everything is is go do more. Yeah. So it's the attitude. I mean, I, 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 oh yeah, an attitude of, uh, you know, here it goes. Now imagine, my father died when I am when I was seven, and one of the quotes, we we were at um, the Hartford PGA golf tournament in Hartford, Connecticut, and um, Arnold Palmer was just starting out. Sam Snead ended up winning the tournament. The following year, Arnold won it in, in uh, 56. Um, well, my father said to me, son, no one ever remembers who came in second. And I took that to heart. So I've been a competitor my entire life, you know, and and you and I have had some you know really interesting conversations about that you know uh, things that you 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 know. However, there is a gift in that. That you know, and and, and I had to learn from that how to lose um, congenially, you mm -hmm. know, <laughs> without going crazy. Uh, without throwing the clubs or throwing the baseball bat or the glove or whatever it might be. Um, you know, it, my art teacher said to me uh, one time, um, delete the need to understand everything. Understand what is important in your life and become a master at that. And don't worry about the everything and and then you know when you come to greg reed's secret knock and a train hire whatever you suck at okay and so that's a, a different way of saying a similar thing you know and and you know and then we got our friend greg i mean uh uh dave corbin you know who who desires us to illuminate the negative so that we can toss it to the side. So I've been illuminating. I've been working on that and, 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 and creating illumination and understand that when I am in front of the mastermind, I create the message. So I have to be positive. I have to, encourage. I have to take action on what I'm doing and encourage action from, from the others. And the coolest thing that we've developed over the years in the mastermind is that we've created a language for all of us to travel on. So we have a similar language when we, when we speak during the hot seat. Um, we, it, it creates value and benefits that are, are not measurable. And it you, creates... Go ahead. I was going to say, it also creates concise and precise language that we understand. And uh, you could see through the mastermind that you taken mastering things to heights that are needed for everybody because you're not only a mastermind person running this mastermind for 40 years you're an exceptional artist 
and you've also have taken several businesses to levels beyond what most people believe even your golf game you have mastered the techniques and have, can teach some golfers and pros including your sons who are now also into golf what is that process as you really hone in on what makes someone super successful in something it's really the six inches between the ears that's what it comes down to you know athletic anybody can have athletic ability and anybody can be good it takes a unique individual to be brilliant at it and so we're taught and and i have unbelievably learned this is that it's 90 percent mental in every game you're in once you get the technique down so uh what is your mental aptitude you know because everything counts everything counts you, our messages matter our practice times matter and the brain this is the coolest thing uh, neuroscientists tell us that our brain doesn't know the difference between actually hitting a golf ball and mentally hitting the golf ball so I've done more practice at home um, you know, mentally than I've ever done on the golf course. And the same thing goes with the mastermind. I mean, the mastermind, and for those that don't know, ours happens to run for two and a half hours. Well, it takes three hours of prep to get ready for the mastermind because we're, we're booking, we're creating opportunities. We're, we're, um, following up on, uh, people's emails or phone calls or we're mentoring we're doing a mini mastermind all those different things add up so what if I skip that the mastermind is not going to go to the level that the individual on the hot seat deserves or the training that we do how is this affecting you as a grandfather now that you're a grandfather. Um, I'm making less mistakes. <laughs> you know, when, when, when your first child is born, um, you really don't know what you're doing. You know, and, and I don't personally believe Dr. Spock was on, on point all the time. I don't think he had it right down. Um, we've learned so much since. So with the, with the grandkids, it's opportunity to redo mm. some of the lessons. And they're so inquisitive. And they understand that, without you know, saying it, that we are, we, we are gifts to them. And our talents are gifts to them. And we're passing down these gifts. The, it's, it's an opportunity to say yes to everything. We embrace yes. And, of course, our mastermind is called the Yes Mastermind. Um, because it's, it's, it's all about being in a position to um, face it follow it fix it it's one of dave corbin's illuminating statements and so face the mistake you had made with your child follow it and decide okay how would i handle it better and fix it by by applying it to your grandchildren what have you learned through your grandchildren oh the, the, the real freedom of being you, mm. it's, it's, it's re-energized, you know, 
the, the stepping into confidence and your power by the choices you make. The connectedness of being with an individual that's, that we're each concentrating on each other 100%. The consciousness, the, yeah, the consciousness of, of emotions and, and the people we're interacting with. And recreating or retouching or tapping back into youth. That happens basically um, every time I'm with them. You know, I don't, when I'm with them, we're there to swap ideas. Their ideas are my ideas. And so, like in most cases, I attempt to listen more because I desire to learn. I mean, we really meet every week at the Mastermind because, by the way, folks, it meets every Tuesday. Uh, rain or shine uh, is to swap ideas. And everyone in that room is an entrepreneur and I'm crazy in love with entrepreneurs because they are the backbone of the United States. You know, and the coolest thing about the, 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 uh, the uh, mastermind is you know, we sit in the middle of a no whining zone. Nobody gets to whine. You want cheese with that wine? You know? <laughs> so what are, what are we illuminating? We're illuminating the ideas to go to whatever level you desire to go to. What projects you know, are you working on? Me personally? Yes. What are you working I'm, on? I'm working on uh, I'm working on that um, that collection of women um, of excellence. I'm working on a um, a children's book, illustrating a children's book on love, with my great friend Johanna Godinez. and I'm working on two coloring books: one on the Beatles, and one on flowers. Um, because I'm, I'm fascinated in, on each of those projects by the, pro, the trajectory of, of each project and our lives. Elaborate on the coloring books. I believe that, um, People absolutely need art in their life. And so I hear all the time, oh, I can't even draw a stick figure. That's crap. You had it in you. And I, I for 10 years in the 70s, I uh, volunteered at Sing Sing Prison as an art teacher. And I probably heard it from every prisoner that they couldn't draw. And every year we had this phenomenal art show. Of course they couldn't go, they were locked up, but I brought, if you can remember PowerPoints, I brought PowerPoints back, <laughs> photographs of them, uh, of, of the show. And I would fill their, their uh, bank accounts in there, you know, cause back in those days, uh, you know, cigarettes, this, that, the other thing, and cigarettes meant safety and what have you. Uh, they, they created phenomenal artwork. Now, it took a while to pull it out of them. And, you know, helplessness is, is a learned uh, piece. And so we would have to remove this, the helplessness to allow them to create. And, of course, we were limited to which of the prisoners we could work with and what um, things that we could use to um, to create with, you know. Um, couldn't be anything they could make a shiv from or any of those kind of things. So there was uh, 
you know, it was all about making their yes that I can do this. Yes, I can do this. Yes, I can do this. Sing in their hearts. And so it's the same thing in the mastermind. We got to get the hearts to sing. Love it. Love it. Patrick, what's the best way for our listeners and viewers to get in touch with you and reach out to you? Well, they could uh, email me at pcar13 at gmail.com or they can get in touch with me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. I'm on it all. And, um, you know. And is there something that you'd like to share that you go, I wish Rima had asked me this and she didn't. Is there something that you want to share with the listeners and audience? I Well, one of the things I, I totally believe in, I don't necessarily think it's something you should have asked me. However, this is a bonus and we'll go with the bonus. Um, develop relationships that strengthen your network. Elaborate on that, please. And you should build three networks. Yeah, you should build three networks. Your information network, which is, you know, education and those kind of things. I probably email out a couple of dozen articles a day that I've read that really pertain to someone in my network, and I pass that on because I think they're learning. A support network. These are individuals that can support you in any crisis, support you um, babysit as little as babysitting, you know, or could write you a $10,000 check without any question. That's in your support network. And then, of course, the biggie one, uh, the referral network, because I totally believe in third-party edification. And um, if, you, if you can picture a sphere, and in this circle inside sphere is um, you, and then there's spokes off the sphere, and there's eight other spheres, circles, um, those are the fill those eight in each network in the information network in the support network and in the referral network and that creates win-win and an opportunity to excel at whatever project you're working on take it to a level you know i could go on and on about this one this is a this is one of my pet my pet things and he's done training for the group on that and it is quite powerful once you understand the power we all hold within us in the network that we build and how it can reach out and inward both ways it's incredible how connected you are to people that you are even so far from there's someone in your network that can definitely get you to that person so just seeing that with the spokes and really understanding that you're gathering around you people that can support you and you're supporting them too. It's, it's a two way street. Absolutely. It, it comes down, you know, and, and when you have those three networks, you know, one of the, uh, the keys as you and I learned that uh, money and you is leverage. And you get to leverage these networks without drama. There's no drama, you know. And and uh, so as you and I have a similar language from that program, uh, which tells us when you're with your network or when you're with a prospect or when you're with someone in your, uh, it, it, you know, that works for you or desires to work for you, ask clarifying questions. And I think you just brought up something that's really important. The program Money and You is a misconception because it's not about the money. It's about the beingness of the human being and the level of thinking and vibration. Elaborate from Absolutely. your perspective of what you would say to someone. One of the key distinctions that I love, love, love coming out of money, you, is the only failure 
is the failure to participate. And through when you go through that program, it taps into four key elements, which is freedom, which we talked about a little earlier, accountability, authenticity, and your network. And, you know, in this world, there's nothing better than building a network that, that supports you and um, creates win, win, win. And uh, the, the, the Money New Network, the, the Yes Mastermind Network, uh, Clinton Swain's Network, you know, the Psy Network, Landmark Network, all of these that, that um, we either heard about or, or have been through um, leads us to clarity around our true purpose. And true purpose always happens at 90 degrees. Just like you understand the ripple effect when I drop a rock into a lake and the ripples go out, the ripples go out at 90 degrees. So tap into distinctions or keys like precession that will change your life. Patrick, thank you so much. This was a perfect way to end this beautiful conversation. I know you and I could talk for hours, but I want to thank you. Thank you from my heart for being present for every gem that you shared with us today. And to our listeners, you. remember your attitude always determines your altitude in life. So if you want your life to begin to move forward and get to the best places of being your best self, it's got to start with your attitude. Thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to seeing you on our next episode. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Thank you for joining us for Attitude of Altitude podcast. You can find us on social media, on Instagram and Facebook under Planet of One. Please come join us. Leave us comments. Let us know if there's something specific that you'd like us to cover. We are here for you to make sure that you become the best version of yourself. Your attitude determines your altitude in life. Thank you again for joining us.